My name's Brandon Westner. I am the One Heart Director for the Real Life Network. And we are very, <clears throat> I say we, are very excited to be up here. Clint and I are going to uh, gonna be sharing a little bit with you. And I, what I want to do is I would like to ask you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 5. And as you open up to 1 Peter chapter 5, I want to read this um, section out of a book called In Search for the Proverbs 31 Man, written by Michelle McKinney Hammond. This is what she says. She says, I must confess that I am grieved. Men are confused. They no longer know what women want or need from them. The women are disappointed and frustrated. They always ask the same questions. Where are the men? What is wrong with them? Why are they not able to commit? In our politically correct efforts to create a world of equality, we have created instead a great big tangled ball of yarn. We have lost sight of the God-given unique strengths we have to offer each other as men and women. As women have become more independent, self-sufficient, and powerful in the business world, I believe many have accepted subtle lie, the subtle lie that they no longer need men. The men, not knowing what is expected of them any longer, have largely abdicated or been forced to resign their posts as leaders. On the other hand, women have begun to groan under the weight of all they're doing and wonder why men no longer step up to the plate. Weariness has set in. So has compromise. For the sake of having a man, countless women have begun to settle for a new, watered-down version of manhood, not really realizing that low expectations of men further perpetuate the downward trend. Women sigh, oh well, men just aren't what they used to be. I believe that, this is how she closes, I believe that in the heart of every man is a desire to be the man his spirit knows he was created to be. Yet staggering numbers of men fear rejection, so they settle for far less than what is required of them. This was written about 14 or 15 years ago. And I think it still defines and helps us kind of put a name to the giant that is what we are facing today. And we're starting, we're not starting a series, we're in a series called First Peter. But today we're starting like a mini-series within a series. And every week for the next three weeks, our main point is going to be this. God calls us to more. And then each week is going to focus on a different layer, a different perspective on what Peter was writing in First Peter chapter 5. And in order for us to really understand what Peter's heart is, which really isn't Peter's heart, really it's God's heart, that Peter was just inspired to write on. We have to remember where we've come from. We've, throughout this series, we've talked about holiness. We've talked about submission. We've talked about suffering. And now, after all of those, uh, those words that Peter writes, this is what he's choosing to end this letter on. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read this section here, this section that Peter is writing to the first century believers that live in what we know today as Turkey, the country of Turkey. And they're trying to figure out how to live a life that honors Jesus and grows closer to him. And this is how Peter is choosing to end, uh, how he's choosing to begin the end of his letter. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, the more handsome one of the two of us will now start reading. This will be verses 1 through 4 initially. So, yeah. yeah. That was good. All right. All right. <clears throat> and now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, 
you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Listen to the words that Peter uses. Care. Appeal. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it grudgingly. Care for the flock. I mean, these are, pro, these are proactive words. These are words where Peter, a leader, an elder, someone who wants to see Jesus' church move forward in momentum, that he is asking other elders and leaders of the church. He's saying, look, don't lead out of abuse. Don't lord it over the people that you are overseeing. And he's speaking directly to leaders, and he's saying, you have to have a heart so that the people know that you're not in it for you, but you're in it for them. These aren't passive words. These aren't words that we can, that, that as the readers were reading, like, okay, we have a choice. We can choose to do this. We can choose not to do this. Now, Peter, is, he's speaking right to the leaders, to the elders of the church. And he's saying, this is how Jesus' church is supposed to be run. How you're supposed to model the life of Jesus and the leadership of Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. So if Peter's talking to the older, more experienced, more seasoned followers of Jesus... In the first four verses. And we read here that Peter says, In the same way, you younger men. Is he talking to just young in terms of physical years on earth? Males of the human species? Well, he's talking to them. But he's talking to everybody who is young in their faith. It's not just physical age. It's also the spiritual kind of walk with Jesus. Those who are brand new to their faith. Those who are just learning what it means to follow Jesus. Peter's saying, look, don't shrug the older people aside. They're not fuddy-duddies. They're not weirdos. They're not people who you can look at and say, well, that may work for you, but it doesn't work for me. He's saying you got to accept their teaching, accept their experience, look to them and know that they've walked through life much longer than you have, and they know more about life than you do. It's okay for you to, 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 to just be open to receive what they are sharing with you because chances are they're investing in you to set you up for success. All right, finishing up verse 5 and then through 7. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Thank you, Clint. <laughs> that was a cute wave, by the way. When, when Peter's talking about all of you, he's saying everybody that's reading, those that are older, those that are younger, men and women. He's saying, remember what I said way back in the beginning when we talked about submission? We talked about submitting to governments. When we talked about submitting to masters, when we talked about submitting to husbands, when we talked about submitting to wives. Like that doesn't, that's not compartmentalized at the beginning of the letter and then we just let it go. Peter's saying all of us, all of you, all of the reader, those who are older, that are in offices of leadership or in roles of leadership, and those who are new to the faith, be identified by humility and own humility. Don't just have someone label it to you, but you got to own it. You have to put it on. You have to wear it. It has to define you. People should look at you and know that you are, sur that you are surrounded, that you are covered, that you are wrapped in humility. Everyone is to humble themselves to God and his power 
And as God was moving around them, as God is moving all the time, and he's working all the time, that, that Peter's saying, trust that God will raise you up when, in the time that he chooses. You just continue to be humble. You continue to be faithful. And God will raise you up. And he will set you on that stand. As Jesus said, who lights a candle and hides it under a bed? Only those who want to burn their mattress, right? Like only those who want to lay in a bed of fire, lights a candle, and then sticks it under the bed. Apparently that was a problem back in first century Jerusalem. He said, no, you put the candle on a stand so the light can shine for all to see. And Peter is saying we need to allow the, hum the he's telling the readers to let the humility sit on a stand for all to see. Because that's who you're to submit to. You're supposed to submit to the Father. Our main point this morning is this which isn't our main point, though it's our main point. It's really Peter's main point. And it's that God calls us to more. And this week we're talking about how God calls us to more humility in our leadership. God calls us to more humility in our leadership. For the last couple months, and I just want to pause here just for a moment. The last couple months I've been asking my family members... Uh, I've been asking people of Real Life South Hill, been asking people on the north side, I've been asking uh, people uh, from other churches that I've attended or friends that I have that are in ministry or attend church. And um, I've asked them this question, when you hear the pastor say that God calls, like that word calls, what does that mean? When you hear that word, what does that mean to you? And let me be honest, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. So... What I want to do this morning is I want, to, I want to help clarify at least what I'm speaking of in this when God calls us to more. What does the word call mean? So we're all on the same page and we all know where we're going. And when people use the word call in a church context, what we're saying is this, is that God is inviting us. He's encouraging us. He's urging us to take a step deeper into our spiritual depth, that we want to grow closer to him. We're not satisfied with the distance that we are between us and him. We have relationship with him, but we're not satisfied with where we are in this moment. We want to go closer to him. We want to get deeper in him. We want to be, uh, we want to live lives of holiness. We want to be, live lives that preach uh, Jesus, transforming us from the inside out. And when, when pastors say the word call or use the word call, all, all that's being said is, is that there's biblical background for, for followers of Jesus to take a step to grow closer to him in these certain areas. That it's not by accident, but it's on purpose. And Peter is on purpose saying that we need to grow closer in our humility and leadership. We need to be more defined by humility in our leadership. We need to be leaders more with humble attitudes, humble hearts. So as we ask God to, bring, to, to help us go deeper in our spiritual depth with our hearts and our hands and our attitudes, knowing that God calls us to more humility in our leadership, that's the first way, that's the first application point, that's the first opportunity we can have to allow this to transform us and not just be head knowledge, is that we are humble in our leadership when we lead with right heart postures. What that means is this. If you're mentoring someone, if you're leading someone, if you're influencing someone, you need to guard your heart and make sure that you're not leading through pride, but you're leading through humility. And let me, be, let me just encourage you, if you're in this room and you have given your life to Jesus, you are a leader. Whether or not you feel it, whether or not you look in the mirror in the morning and as you're shaving, okay, I won't touch that. So... Men and women, whether or not you're shaving, if you look in the mirror, as you're getting ready for work in the morning, and you, what you see, you see the flaws. 
You see, you see the marks on your face from scars, from accidents, from circumstances. You see blemishes. You, you see what no one else sees because you see the same face every morning. And sometimes that's a blessing and sometimes that's a curse. And I want you to know that the person that you see in the mirror is a leader. So I'm not talking to just pastors or just elders or just uh, people on a staff or people who are employees that lead uh, forms of management. I'm talking to all people right now. All of you that are sitting in, in these chairs in this room, you are a leader because leadership is nothing more or less than influence. Do you have influence over one person? If the answer is yes, you are a leader. And you can choose whether to lead positively or lead negatively, but you will be leading. You will be influencing. And if we're going to lead the way Jesus has created us to lead, remember uh, Michelle talked about how men know that there's something more, that they want to be who God has created them to be. And what I want to say is that I'm not asking you, and Peter's not asking you, and God isn't asking you to be someone you're not. He's asking you, asking you to be someone you are. God created and wired us for this. He created us for leadership. He created us for influence. The choice isn't if he created us for it. It's if we choose to engage in it or not. For those who believe in Jesus, they have the Holy Spirit living inside them. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells us, is to guide us, it's to counsel us, it's to give us wisdom, and to give us direction. And aren't those things that leaders do and offer? And so for those who have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, for those who have given their lives to Jesus, you have the spirit of leadership in you. And he wants to use you. He wants to flow through you. He wants to use you in ways that, that people would say, man, that's wise. Man, that's great guidance. Man, that's great counsel. The things that he offers, he wants to use you to speak through you in those situations. The problem isn't the spirit inside of us. It's the heart that we allow the spirit to flow out of us in. So sometimes we forget the humility part. I mean, this isn't something new. This is something that even the Old Testament talks about often. About how leaders would abuse their right and lord it over those that they lead. Specifically, if you're looking for one specific example, I'll give you, write down Ezekiel chapter 34. A messenger from God is talking to the leaders of Israel and he says, look, not only are you abusing the, the, the sheep that are your flock. But he goes into great description to talk about not only are you robbing the sheep so that you feel good and you receive more, but then the, the grass that your sheep eat, all you're doing is walking around trampling on the grass so that the grass is bad so the sheep can't eat. To make sure that they know that you're in charge. Jesus in Matthew Chapter 20 says, look, the, the, the rulers and the officials, they lord it over you. They flaunt their influence. But a leader in the kingdom, it is different. So if you want to be first, you need to become a slave. If you want to be great, you have to become the least. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And this idea of having a humble heart that, that we're leading with the right heart posture is not just something that, that, that sounds good. And it's something that's biblical, something that's been tested through time. And we see it over and over. Well, a heart posture and leadership is not so we can look good or important, but help others step into the gifting and influence that God has created them to operate in. And so as we mentioned about generosity and we preached on generosity and said, hey, moms, this is how you've been generous. I want to do the same thing this morning. Dads, men, there is opportunity for us because I'm, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a man as well. 
there's opportunity for us to engage who God has created us to be and to lead the way God has created us to lead. It's not through abuse. It's not through lording. Other authors of the Bible say don't exasperate your kids. Don't, don't poke the bear to make the people that you lead angry so that you can exert your will. It's not a power trip. But we're to humble ourselves. We're to give up our lives. God has given us families and workplaces and hobbies, and he's given us the church. More leaders equals more momentum. And days are gone when we should say, who should step up to lead us? But how many leaders can we have to lead us? We need more than just one. We need many people to lean in and engage the leadership platform and opportunity that God has created you and me to live in so that we can influence people in the name of Jesus in a healthy and positive way. And if we don't step into it, who will? And then when we get frustrated because we feel like we aren't getting recognized and people aren't listening to us, and if only they would listen to us and the experience we have, believing that we have an idea that may make something better or, or have more quality, but we aren't choosing to step into how God has created us, then, where, then what, who and what do we have any reason to complain about? Men, you have what it takes. You don't need to add anything more than what you have because God has uniquely created you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made to be the leader that your family needs, that this church needs, that our culture needs. Take a look at the leadership, not just in our country, but around the world. And tell me, how many leaders do we see who lead with humble hearts? And how many times do we say they're only in it to get the next office? They're only in it for four more years. We chant four more years. Or we chant for someone else to get four years. But what is it that we think when we start seeing leaders in our country and, in, and around the globe, and we get mad and frustrated because once they get into office or they serve some term of leadership, all of a sudden they start thinking about themselves and they're concerned about how they look and how they're remembered. Not what's good for those that they're leading. Jesus said, if you want to be first, you need to be last. Men. God is calling us to more. He wants us to be effective in life. And that means being the leader that God has created us to be. And it means that we have to lead with the right heart posture. Second thing is this. We are humble in our leadership when we lead with open minds. If the first one talked about mentoring and mentors, the second one's about apprentices. And if you're learning, you have to remember, I have to remember, we aren't perfect. We know that. So why then do we have expectations of people being perfect right away? Why do we think we have to be perfect right away? We're never going to be perfect the first time we try something new, especially in leadership. That's okay. There needs to be room for growth, room for failure, room that we could stand up and keep walking and know that the grace of Jesus covers us. Humble leaders are learners of how to hear God. Humble leaders are learners of their strengths and their weaknesses. Peter's a great example of both of these. We need to keep in mind that we aren't perfect, just like Peter wasn't, but Peter was still an elder and leader of the church. We have to have humble leadership, and humble leadership includes confession and repentance. We have to be able to admit when we're wrong, when we make mistakes, and how we can move forward and how we can turn from that decision and know that there's forgiveness. It's not just a biblical thing. It's a lifestyle. It's not just when we feel like it. It should be a daily thing of confession and repentance. And I want to ask you men and women, I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But how many of the men in the room, when they get something new that they have to put something together, do not read the instruction manual? 
right? I know where I'm going. Don't get the map application out. I'll find it. It's okay for us men to ask. It's okay for us women to ask. It's okay for leaders to ask and, and, and be humble, not just in our heart, but also be open to learn and have an open mind and know that there's different perspectives, know that there's different weaknesses and strengths that we have and we can learn from each other. Even when it means humbling ourselves to the point where we have to open up an instruction manual and read how to turn on the TV with the remote control. Because there's five different power buttons today. Maybe it's just my remote control, I don't know. But to understand that it's okay to ask questions. Sometimes the best way to be a leader is by asking questions and allowing others to come alongside. God calls us to more. He calls you to more. He calls me for more. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is not satisfied. The Father is not satisfied with just the people in this room. He loves us. He wants us. He's so happy that we're in a loving relationship with him. But the Creator wants all all of his creation, not just some of it. And if we're going to be the people that God has wired us to be, if we're going to be the people that he's created us to be, if we believe that God has made us for strengths and we have weaknesses and we're to rely on each other so that we can be part of a group of people called the church, we have to move together. We have to be humble toward each other. We have to be willing to learn from each other. That's the best form of leadership. That's the best form of creating a healthy body of Jesus. And when we engage in that and we're allowing God to call us to more, to increase in the spiritual depth of our humility, more people will become disciples. And we'll need more mentors, more people who are more mature in their faith to help show those who are new in their faith what it means to be a follower of Jesus every day, not just Sunday morning. That we want to be a church that allows Jesus to shape us to be who He wants us to be, how He wants us to worship. And that's not just mentoring individuals, but it's also planting churches. We want to be a church who plants churches. And we're a church plant. Because God wants more. He wants all of His creation to operate how He created them to be. And that's with everybody having relationship with Him. The only way we're going to reach the world for Jesus, one person at a time, is when all of us understand that we can influence one person. And anyone who has influence over one person is a leader. So women, I'm asking you, answer the call and lean into more. Practice what God has given you in the area of leadership. Men, dads, answer the call as God wants you to be who he's created you to be. You have what it takes. All we need to do is just be motivated and say yes and then follow through. And even when you fail, it's okay. Because just because we fail doesn't mean we're a failure. The Bible says the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. But those who are wicked lay in their calamity. That means that people fail but the grace of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus lifts them back up. Let's be leaders. Let's be the leaders that God has created us to be. Let's be the people that God has created us to be. God calls us to more, more humility and leadership. Would you stand with me?
And I believe that there are some of you here that you are in forms of leadership. You are in areas of leadership and you have answered that call. But God is asking you to do more. God is asking you to lean in more. But I think this morning isn't just for those who are leaders. I think it's for, for those who aren't leaders right now. It's for people who wish that they could influence people, but they don't know how. And they think that they feel guilty because they're not taking advantage of those who are looking up to them. And I'm saying that's the kind of heart that you want to lead with. And so we're going, to have a, we're going to have a team up here for prayer. And if you would like prayer in terms of stepping into what God is asking you to do, what he's calling you to do, I'm asking you to take a step out and come down and be encouraged because you have what it takes to be the leader that God has created you to be. It's just relying on him, knowing that he will lift us up when it's his timing. And maybe you're here today and you've never heard someone say that God loves you and that God wants you. You are God's creation and He wants you. And I want to ask you if you've never given your life to Jesus, but today's the day when you want to step into who He's created you to be. That as you say yes to Him in your heart and as the worship team plays, we have a team in the back, a, ba a team to lead for baptism and we want to celebrate with you as you give your life to Jesus and you take the steps that God has for you in the area of leadership and influence we want to baptize you in this tank and we've got shorts and shirts and towels and we are going to celebrate with you because you're part of a family here but I want to ask you this morning what is it what step do you need to take so that you can be the leader you can be the influencer that God has created you to be and what is it that someone needs to speak over your life so that you will believe it? Would you pray with me? Father, we are so humbled because we have no idea what we're doing. Sometimes we feel like we know everything and we're successful and we get Father's Day cards and Mother's Day cards and thank you cards and you're a great boss card. And then there's days we feel like we just completely tank and we have no idea what we're doing. Lord, would you help us be who you've created us to be? And as we influence people, as we lead people, as we mentor people, would we do it with humble hearts and would we do it with open minds? Help us learn from you. Help us see what you see in us and help us be the men and help us be the women help us be the dads and the moms that you have called and created us to be help us be inspired to lean into nothing more or nothing less than who you've created us to be thank you God for your faithfulness thank you for your grace and thank you for your leading Church, if there's anyone here who'd like to pray, we'll have a team come up. Come up forward now and pray. Go back and get baptized. But let's take a moment and worship the Lord.